in the old calendar, we have the feast of St. Therese of Lisieux, but it is also another day which brings back many memories, for it is in the Franciscan family the day of what is called the Transitus of St. Francis, when he actually died. And a number of years ago, on this day, I found myself in a fairly large monastery of the second order, that is the ladies, the poor clares, in that case of perpetual adoration, where there was a friend of mine making her solemn vows. And many things came to me on that day, especially as it was a Franciscan, a Capuchin, who was their bishop, who was therefore presiding over the celebration. And I noticed many things coming through, even in the liturgy. The repetition of such expressions as the seraphic order, which of course goes back to this link which these saints had with the angelic world, of which we have been thinking in these last days with these feasts of the angels passing us by. Seraphs, seraphim in Hebrew, these are the burning ones, for seraph means to burn in Hebrew. And these saints on earth were very much aware of what they were doing when they were handling the divine. They were also very much aware of what they were not, and this comes through very strongly in the case of this particular saint, St. Francis, who did not dare to opt for the priesthood, even though he was well ordainable. Humility kept him a deacon. And so too, these ladies, the poor Clares, the poor ladies, the poor dames of St. Clair, opted for a simplicity, an austerity, a hiddenness, and that means hiddenness big time traditionally, which separates them even visibly from men. And these, because of that separation from the human, had access precisely to the seraphic mode and realm, the only real one. I am quite convinced that when it comes to the crunch, when the soul departs from the body, it realizes for the first time the real proportion and order of things. And I am sure that the vast majority at that cosmic point in existence and time, henceforth irreversible, say to themselves, if only I had known. Whereas these, like Thérèse of Lisieux, who already at the age of 15 were separated from the world, knew already what life was about. Now, one can attribute her early death to mere natural causes, tuberculosis, true. But let us remember that certain things, especially without the modern medical means of handling these things, lead to tuberculosis. There was no heating at all in these monasteries, and it's quite chilly in Normandy and wet. And therefore, she was genuinely a victim. She knew the risks of entering that place. Indeed, her whole family tried it, and all except one died there. The sisters, Leonie, eventually ended up with the visitation nuns, enclosed, of course, but a slightly more moderate regime. Indeed, they were founded partly for that. But Thérèse of Lisieux was, as it were, akin to us there where I was living for a good while in Normandy in France. I had known, as one can know in the Trappist life, Frère Marie Bernard. And I was there in 1974 for a month in the, in the holidays, the long vacation. I spent it at Tatra, and he was there. I remember praying next to him. Well, he, by then, was already an old man, but he had been the spiritual father to Mother Agnes, the sister of Therese. Mother Pauline, oh, sorry, Pauline was the real name, and sister, Mother Agnes was her name in religion. And this had gone on for years, but before they both died, Mother Agnes died first, she had asked that the correspondence be destroyed. So that is a secret forevermore, whatever passed between them. However, the current passed, and he, being a sculptor, 
sculpted that statue which by now has gone round the world. The one with her holding the crucifix and then with the rose or roses. That's the classic one that came from La Trappe from his hand and went round the world. And not only that, but the abbot was very much on fire for our local saint. Knew all about her and often proclaimed her in his teaching in chapter. And indeed, one year, he invited the world expert on Thérèse of Lisieux to give us her annual retreat. And so for seven or eight days, French style, we had high powered and highly compressed lectures on the inside story. And believe you me, there's more to Thérèse than meets the eye. And as icing on the cake, when the heavy lectures were over, he gave us a treat at the end, the appendix. And that's the bit that one remembers. What happened after her death? He knew because he'd researched it. And she, it seems, is one of the greatest saints of modern times, far more present and powerful than one thinks. She is keeping literally her promise to spend her heaven doing good on earth. And this shower of roses still happens, discreetly, but the petals come. You may have had experiences yourself. By the way, some years ago, a little child who was with us on retreat one time, he was from Belfast, he had received from somebody, I think a priest, now long dead, who had been present at some event. It was, I believe, the day when St. Therese was canonized in 1925. And there had been a miraculous occurrence, it seems, on that day, and roses had actually appeared. They had descended miraculously somehow onto the earth. And one of these, two of them actually, had been collected. I was given one, and he kept the other, but he wanted me to have one. And these are genuine signs of her intervention. Indeed, after that retreat, I started to invoke her when any problem came, and lo and behold, things actually would happen. Literally. But anyway, things like this came out of his last lecture, the appendix lecture. The details went something like this, but the gist of it is certainly that something weird happened which should not have happened in the normal order of events. It was down in India, there was some lady, a mother of a family, in dire straits. There was no way she could get out of this mess. It was all crumbling around her. She had to appeal to the authorities and she knew what that meant. Probably a brick wall. Anyway, after a long time in the waiting room, she was called in and started, started to plead her cause. And she hadn't got to the end of it when the gentleman behind the bureau said to her, my good woman, do you not know that this nun has just been here and sorted out your problem? What did she look like? Oh, you must know. She's a friend of yours. And on he went. And a detailed description was given. Now, she had no clue what was going on, but she had a great devotion to Tante Therese of Lisieux. And eventually, I forget the details of how, but it was through some picture, she or he recognized who it was who had intervened. Therese had been around. That miracle happened also in the case of our local saint in Italy, St. Catherine of Siena. She would get around even after her death. But these are human beings. Indeed, if one looks under the skin, one finds a very human human being. Almost a sacred mischievousness in Therese. When she was in an agony of pain, dying of the atrocious dis decomposition of tuberculosis, as it was called, isn't it, consumption in the old formula, she was able to come up with a thing like this. Mm. Mm. When Monsieur the Doctor comes, I'll drink a glass of milk, because at the end of it I'm always more mission than ever before. Uh, in other words, she knew exactly the power of wit, even on her deathbed. And when it came to the crunch, the pain was so atrocious that all she could say was, Je ne saurais mourir, I don't know how to die. One of us who got there, using the same instruments that we have, 
bearing Sister X, who thought to the end that she was her best friend, and only when told in confession years afterwards, when she asked the priest, but who was that sister so beloved to her, who got on her nerves? Mais ma soeur, c'était vous! It was you. So great was her charity that the other one never ever copped on. And it can be our case as well, that we can be sources of martyrdom to the person right next to us and never realize the pain.